session meetings. If I could have a motion, please. Motion. Motion by Commissioner Berger. Second. Second by Commissioner McManus. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. I have some preliminary announcements. The First District Court of Appeals allows us to use their facilities, so please respect the rules and have absolutely no food or beverage other than water in this room. Please silence your cell phones. Anyone addressing the commission, please speak up so our recording equipment can pick you up properly and please come to the podium. My fellow count, uh, commission members, please be sure to speak up and into the microphone as well uh, so that those who are watching this on our live stream can hear you. Members, we do have a good bit of work today, so I'll ask you to be as brief and concise as possible in your questions and comments. Pursuant to Section 286.0114, Florida Statutes, members of the public have the opportunity to have input on matters before the Commission, other than in cases in which we act in a quasi-judicial capacity. This means the public can have input on matters other than complaints, opinions, and determinations on financial disclosure cases. If you desire to be heard in this matter, please fill out a speaker card and give it back to Ms. Blaze in the back who has her hand up. Now we move on to item four, consideration of advisory opinions. We have two on our agenda today. File 2753 will be presented by Gray Schaefer. Is the requester here? Mr. Schaefer, if you would proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this opinion request comes from a member of the Brooksville City Council. His wife currently serves as the city's clerk, and he asks if he could be found a violation of the state anti-nepotism law, which is section 112.3135 of the statutes, if the city council where he serves were to approve a salary increase for his wife's position. And the way in which the salary increase will occur is a little bit complex, but from what I understand, the city manager, who has general managerial responsibilities over city personnel, will bring a request to the city council for a budgetary appropriation. The council will then approve the appropriation and direct the city manager to use it to increase the salary of the city clerk. The inquiry asks if this could trigger the anti-nepotism law if the proposed appropriation is for $10,000. The analysis here is relatively straightforward. The anti-nepotism statute prohibits a public officer from appointing employing, promoting, or advancing a relative, or for advocating for the appointment, employment, promotion, or advancement of a relative. It's a relatively strict statute. Uh, by its very language, it says it'll be triggered even if just the collegial body on which the public officer sits decides to appoint or advance one of his or her relatives, even if uh, the public officer doesn't participate in that decision. Here, the city council member's wife is already serving as a city clerk, so the opinion focuses in on whether a salary increase for her position, if approved by the city council, could constitute a prohibited advancement or promotion under the law. And there's an appellate court case in the First District Court of Appeal that is very much on point here. It's called Slaughter versus the City of Jacksonville. Slaughter concerned a circuit court clerk who wanted to extend his son, an employee of his, uh, a merit-based pay increase. And the opinion found that under the nepotism law, a prohibited advancement or promotion would only occur if the sum was being elevated to a higher rank or to a position of greater dignity or importance. And the court found that because the merit-based pay increase there would not affect or change the son's civil service grade, meaning it would stay within the limit fixed for his particular pay grade, his position, that it would not constitute a prohibited advancement or promotion triggering the statute. The Commission on Ethics has consistently applied slaughter to find that merit-based pay increases or across-the-board pay raises, which don't affect or go beyond what's allowed by a relative's pay grade, won't constitute an advancement or promotion triggering the law. But when the pay or benefits being offered are not commensurate with the pay grade, when they go above and beyond it, uh, then you have found a violation. The draft applies slaughter here and recommends you find the city council member will not be in violation of the nepotism statute as long as any appropriation the council approves for his wife's position stays within the salary range authorized for her pay grade. Now from what we've been told, the possible $10,000 appropriation that they asked about will just exceed or go over the top end of her salary range. So to be safe, the draft recommends that the council should carefully calculate any appropriation meant to go towards a city clerk's position 
so that it stays within the salary range for that position. Now this is an overview of the draft and I'm offering it for your review. I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, one other thing I do want to say, even though the city attorney and the council member are not here today, I've spoken to the city attorney. Uh, she and the council member have read the opinion. They understand it. They don't have any problems with it. And uh, with that, I offer it for your review. Are there any questions for Mr. Schaefer? Mr. Carvajal. So I know the request was particularly about the Atlantine nepotism law, but uh, I don't see a footnote or any comments about the disproportionate benefit provisions that was passed under Amendment 12. And I think that caution probably needs to be considered as well, because this is obviously going to benefit, and while there's no ill intent, shouldn't there be a caution in that as well? Well, I, through the chair, I have two thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, the disproportionate benefit provision, the Constitution, uh, our position is that it won't become effective until the legislature authorizes a penalty for it. So we haven't kind of put it into play yet in terms of our opinions and our cases. And also under the rule that you all approved last July, as long as the council member here is not acting in a manner uh, that's inconsistent with the proper performance of their duties, uh, it won't be considered violative of that particular constitutional amendment. Uh, so here, as long as the uh, pay increase for the employee stays within the limits uh, authorized for a particular position, I don't think you will, will have something that's prohibited by the nepotism statute, so it won't constitute then a, a violation of that disproportionate benefit position, as long as he abstains from the vote. And that is in a footnote in the opinion. I mean, even if this complies the nepotism law, he's going to have to make sure that he abstains from any vote on the, on the uh, appropriation, because that could trigger a voting conflict for him. Mr. Carvajal. Follow up, thank you. Um, I guess I have two questions, and I did see footnote seven that does talk about um, the items that you mentioned, but um, what is not clear is who set those pay ranges, and if it's the council as well, then he may need to abstain from those votes, and it's nepotism regardless, it's just a matter of whether it's a violation to some degree. I mean, there's obviously an impact, isn't there? Well, again, the slaughter decision just talks about a nepotism violation when the person is being elevated to a position of greater dignity or importance. And slaughter said that will not happen as long as their pay increase stays within the limit fixed for their particular position. So under a strictly reading of slaughter, as long as this appropriation stays within her pay range, I'm not sure it will be a nepotism violation. Um, and uh, it, I'm, your other question, Commissioner, I'm sorry. I, it, does that clarify your, your question, or do you, is there something else you want me to talk about? The, the other item wasn't so much a question as a note that um, uh, it's actually not covered in here is who sets the pay range. Is That's it, right. Is the council or the, or the city manager? My understanding uh, from, what I've been, from what I've looked at here is that uh, the pay ranges have been set and established by a vote of the council from several years ago. Um, and so I don't think that is particularly an issue that, that had to be addressed in the opinion, in my, in my take on it. I will say that from what we've been told, from what the city attorney has told me, uh, the council is contemplating changing the parameters of some of those salary ranges in the near future. Uh, that wasn't specifically what they asked about here, so that's not addressed in the opinion. I think that would probably have to come back before you all as another formal opinion, though. You know, whether or not changing the overall pay range itself, the parameters of the salary, could constitute an nepotism violation. That's kind of a, a separate issue that I would hope they would ask about in the future. Any other questions from There's, the Commission? Commissioner Brady? It's not nepotism because <laughs> he didn't participate in her initial employment. Is that the... Well, th there's two separate issues here. Uh, last July, it was either May or July, uh, the question was raised of will it be a nepotism violation if his wife is appointed to serve in the city clerk position? Okay. And we wrote them a letter at that time. We didn't bring that before you all because it was pretty clear that it wasn't a nepotism violation. Uh, the city charter vests the city manager with the sole authority to appoint someone to the city clerk position. Okay. It doesn't have to be run past the city council. Um, this is kind of a separate issue. This is a salary increase. Okay. They'll take the form of an appropriation request that the city manager does have to run past the city council. So for that reason, it's kind of a separate issue that I think does merit a nepotism analysis in the context of this city council member. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other questions from members? Commissioner Leslie? I, I had the same thought as uh, Commissioner Perlhall about if we want to go ahead and give her something that's above her current pay grade, given this opinion, it sort of leads them to adjusting the pay grade, her pay range, and providing the raise. And so I don't know if it's possible to explicitly say we're not answering that question, so sort of caution them against doing that, because to me that would be the logical uh, mechanism if they wanted to ensure she gets the amount they want to give her to go ahead and change her, her pay grade without changing her duties, which to me would certainly constitute advancement, but might not in their eyes. Uh, through the chair, I'd be happy to add a footnote clarifying that if the, there's an upcoming measure to change the pay grade for the position, that, that that is not being addressed in the context of this opinion, and that will have to take the form of a future opinion request to this body. Commissioner Lesnoff, would you like that to be done? Yes, okay. Chairman. Yes. I think on the same note, I wasn't, I'm not opposed to the statements as they're presented here, but any cautionary measures uh, related to potentially how the impact of the constitutional amendment might come into play once that is defined would also be worth it. Because let's just say that the salary increase doesn't happen until after that. I want to make sure that we have laid out every caution for the, uh, for the commission. Mr. Schaefer, can you add another cautionary note as well? I, th I, I can. Okay. You know, I, I think what I would say in terms of the amendment uh, is something along the lines of, uh, you know, to, to, to ensure that, that you stay within the parameters of what's allowed by the amendment. It's recommended to make sure that you, you know, file the advice given herein to the letter, uh, as well as any other applicable local ordinances regarding salary increases. Mr. Carpenter, would that satisfy you? Yeah, I think it's as much caution as possible. Okay. I question whether that is going to come up over and over again that somebody wants to um, or that the, this commission wants to keep reminding people about the, the constitutional amendment language and if that's going to keep coming up over and over again maybe we need to think about some standard language because uh, you could you could argue disproportionate benefit in a lot of these cases, uh, and are we going to start? You know, this is the way the courts look at things: is you don't answer questions that you don't have to answer, uh, because you get into predicting what the question and the answer are going to be, and then later on, it doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. So it, I think being a lawyer and a former judge, it occurs to me we should be careful about making a lot of cautionary or unnecessary uh, statements in these opinions. So that's just kind of a counter argument for doing this. But if you're going to do it, think about language that you can live with in the future that's going to be usable over and over again. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the Commission? Seeing none, could I have a motion and could the motion include the cautionary notes as well? Move to adopt the opinion with the cautionary notes requested by Commissioners. Uh, move, uh, motion by Commissioner Brady, second by Commissioner Grant. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, it passes unanimously with the two small changes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schaefer. And the next item is file 2755, which will be presented by Steve. I know I'm going to butcher your name. I apologize. Zulokowski? That's right. All right. Thank you. Is the requester here? Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, this opinion was requested by Frederick J. Elbrecht, the county attorney for Sarasota County on behalf of the Sarasota County Board of Commissioners. Nathan Benderson Park is a unique county park within Sarasota County that contains a multi-use sports venue and a state-of-the-art rowing facility. In 2014, to meet the needs of this park, the county contracted with a nonprofit organization to manage and operate the park in exchange for funding. The nonprofit organization is called SANCA, and its role, uh, its sole nonprofit purpose is to provide financial and managerial 
support for Nathan Benderson Park. <clears throat> this nonprofit has a board of directors and currently none of the county commissioners serve on the board. The county and Sanka are in the process of updating their agreement. The, um, subject to the formal approval by both boards, the county and Sanka have informally agreed to reserve a dedicated seat on Sanka's board for whomever the county might choose to fill that board seat, even potentially one of the county commissioners themselves. It is with this background that the requester asks whether a prohibited conflict of interest uh, would, be, would exist if a county commissioner became a director on the board of Sanka. <clears throat> the opinion begins to answer this question by analyzing the facts under section 112.313 subsection 3 of the Florida statutes. This is the prohibition against doing business with one's own agency. The opinion reasons that if a Sarasota County Commissioner joined Sanka now, after the county had already purchased property management services from Sanka back in 2014, then a conflict under the statute could not be present because the commissioners were only on one side of that agreement when the purchase occurred. Once it is established that a county commissioner could join the board of Sanka now without posing a conflict for himself or herself, the opinion then asks, well, what happens once a county commissioner is on the board and the county and Sanka want to go back and amend this agreement? At the start of the last paragraph on page four, the draft opinion cautions that this would treat, that this commission would treat that new, that, that amendment as a new agreement. And the county commissioner would technically then be acting in a public capacity to purchase property management services from a business entity in which he or she is a board member. Thus, without the application of certain exemptions, amending the agreement at that point would pose a conflict under section 112.313 subsection 3. The draft before you stands for the proposition that an exemption should be applied here. The commission has opined in the past, and those opinions are cited in the draft before you, that, there, that where a nonprofit entity holds a dedicated board seat for a political subdivision to appoint someone, that indicates a unity of interest between the nonprofit and the political subdivision. In this instance, where the county and Sanka are in the process of making such an agreement, we would not only have an organizational alignment between the two entities in the form of a reserve, uh, in, in the form of a reserve board seat, but we would have an alignment of their goals and interests in that both the county and Sanka are invested in the proper stewardship of this park. A dedicated board seat on the nonprofit board and the shared interests of, and goals indicate that this is not simply a conflicting sale between a seller and a buyer, but a joint effort between Sanka and the county to manage Nathan Benderson Park for the benefit of the county residents. Applying section 112.316 to find a unity of interest here would negate a conflict of interest arising under section 112.313 subsection 3. If the county and Sanka ultimately agree to hold a dedicated board seat for the county. I present this draft for your consideration, and I'm available to answer any questions about it that you might have. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Lesnau. So this commissioner who now has a vested interest in this nonprofit, I presume the commission votes on their budget, how much money this nonprofit is going to earn. Uh, is there not room for some misdeed there, given given the potential to provide uh, certain salaries and benefits to uh, everyone involved, potentially any board members as well. I'm presuming the board members are not paid, but are there other benefits that could be received? Um, you're right, they, they're, they are uncompensated on the, on the board of Sanka. Um, but one of the opinions that's cited in here, and I didn't cite this particular language, but it, this commission has addressed that idea in the past. And what they said was, when the, when the subdivision is appointing somebody to the nonprofit board, that person is representing the county's interests and not their own interests. They didn't get this board uh, appointment on their own and uh, to represent their own interests on this board. Instead, they are re they're appointed by the county to represent the county interests. Um, and that's the idea behind uh, finding this unity of interest, that this is really the county's seat and the county can appoint 
whomever uh, it would think would represent its interests. Right, I would agree. However, once a member of that board, uh, they may be succumb to the interests of the nonprofit and supersede the interests, or those interests become uh, commingled, which doesn't sound particularly ethically healthy to me. But, mm -hmm. um, that, that would be my concern. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Mr. Commissioner Brady. They don't necessarily have to appoint a commissioner. They could no, appoint they could. anybody they wanted, but their job is to represent the hypothetical interests of the county rather than being commissioner itself. Through the chair. Um, yes. the, the, they, the, this agreement isn't firmed up yet, but what they imagine happening is that they would be able to appoint whomever they want mm -hmm. and um, this would be arranged through a, an amendment to this contract. It would be enforced through a mechanism that if Sanka didn't appoint the person that the county chose, then Sanka would be in a breach. Um, but they can appoint whomever, not just a county commissioner. The opinion assumes that uh, they want to know what their options are for appointing. If they appoint a county commissioner, then this opinion would um, assist them in making that decision. If, if this opinion goes the other way and then they can't, then they would make another decision for, for to choose somebody else for the board. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Could I have a motion? Move to approve the opinion as uh, presented. I'll second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Brady, commis uh, second by Commissioner Meggs. All in favor, or, excuse me, any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Nay. Uh, uh, motion passes with one nay by Commissioner Lesnoff. Item five, consideration of financial disclosure appeals. <clears throat> this consists of appeals of automatic fines under the financial disclosure law. There is no appeal in which the appellant has asked to be heard. Thus, we will take up the no hearing appeals. Are there any matters that any commissioner wishes to take off this list to discuss separately or to vote on separately. Hearing none, if I could have a motion to approve on Moss. Motion to approve um, item five, consideration of financial disclosure and pales in Moss. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Berger, second by Commissioner Lesnoff. Any discussion? All in favor, please. Well, yes, I, Commissioner McManus. Yeah, I, I've been looking at these for many meetings and particularly this one. And I did have some questions of policy. Is it appropriate now to? Certainly. Just first, it seems to me that we send out notices that are not required by law. Is that right? I think, I don't know if somebody can answer these. Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, yes sir, we, we do abundant notice and uh, Ms. Holmes is in the back, she's the heads up that section and she can be real specific on it if you'd like more detail on that, but I think we do kind of bend over backwards to, to let people know about things. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm going. And two, uh, it seems like some of these people who claim ignorance have already held office for more than that year and they certainly should know that they need to file, although some of them occasionally are, have left office and there's a lot of confusion about that. And then uh, see, what I'm leading to is should we, in some of these cases, hold the office holders uh, responsible even though they claim, oh, they didn't get notice and this and that. I notice you have to have due process, of course. Uh, and the other problem is they change their addresses and they don't tell us. Do they have any burden to do that? Uh, through the chair, if I might. Um, uh, the, uh, <coughs> of course, what we have here is, is, is in addition to the general notion of due process, you have these particular things about notice in the statute and, and sometimes that can generate a, a reason for waiving the fine. I think uh, going forward, uh, we're in the process now of a project for electronic filing of financial disclosure, and it's going to take a couple of years for that to be implemented. But when that when that comes about, it's going to be a different regimen for people being notified. And and I think specifically in the electronic filing bill, there's a provision that 
failure to monitor an email account, which would be the equivalent now of failure to keep your address updated, that that sort of stuff is, is going to be policed better and should be seamless once that system is up. So I think that the electronic filing is going to, to, to alleviate some of that. Uh, <coughs> Historically, there have been a lot of people that have failed to keep the addresses up, but because of the notice requirements of the statute and, and the technicalities in there that go beyond really constitutional due process, we have to end up waiving a lot of these things, even though in a, in a human sense the people are sort of sloppy in their life and their, their organization. Okay. I, I just would encourage the staff to work on taking those steps that you mentioned once it gets, goes to electronic to try to toughen this up a little bit because I think some of these people are just getting off the hook too easily. Thank you for I won't comment. be here to vote on it by that time. But. <laughs> Any? Yes, Commissioner Berger. I just wanted to comment on what um, Commissioner McManus says. There's, there's an inefficiency where there's a great deal of time and effort in constantly giving notice after notice, and then it comes to us, and we have an obligation to read the information and have a motion and a second and a vote on based upon the recommendations that are given us. So I think hopefully in the future these changes will help, because certainly I agree with what Commissioner McMahon mm -hmm. says about their bending over backwards to babysit, for lack of a better term, to get people just to comply. Any other discussion? All right. Um, there's been a motion and a second. All in favor of approving these um, draft orders signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries. Item six, consideration of final orders on financial disclosure funds where there has been no time of appeal and no payment. The item is self-explanatory via the written materials you have been provided. If there are no questions, do I hear a motion to approve these final orders on Moss? So moved. Motion. Was that Commissioner Lesnoff mm -hmm. for the second? And motion by Commissioner McManus. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Now on item seven, consideration of rulemaking. We have two rule hearings on today's agenda. The first rule hearing will concern Rule 34-7.010, Florida Administrative Code, and the second rule hearing will concern Rule 37-7.025, Florida Administrative Code. The purpose of a public hearing is to allow the Commission to hear public comments, evidence, and argument about the proposed rule or proposed change to an existing rule. Following each of the two public hearings, the Commission will decide whether to make any changes in response to public comments, or written materials received, or whether to accept the rule or rule change as noticed. The Commission may withdraw a rule or proposed rule change in whole or in part, or may make such changes as are supported by the record of the public hearing or any written materials we have received. The Commission <coughs> also may make technical changes which do not affect the substance of the rule. The first rule hearing regards Rule 34-7.010. The hearing is now open. I'll ask Mr. Schaefer, who prepared the item, to explain the rule change and put us in the proper posture, and then we'll proceed with the public hearing, deliberation, if any, and vote. Mr. Schaefer, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as you said, there's two rule amendments coming before you today. I think they're both fairly straightforward. They, refer they reflect some recent changes that were made to our laws during the 2019 legislative session. The First Amendment is to remove subsection 1J from Rule 34-7.010. Uh, that subsection, 1J, implemented a particular statutory law in the Code of Ethics, the Blind Trust Law, which is currently found in Section 112.31425. The Blind Trust Law stated that public officers who create a blind trust uh, will not have a conflict of interest under certain ethics provisions, like the Voting Conflict Statute, regarding any interest held within the Blind Trust. Uh, subsection 1J of this rule implemented the Blind Trust Law by incorporating a form the Form 40, which public <laughs> officers could use to set up the blind trust, and by using the Form 40, they'd be certifying that the trust was in compliance with all statutory requirements. Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Form 40 has only been used four or five times since the law was uh, enacted several years ago. 
Now, legislation was signed into law during this most recent legislative session, which repealed the blind trust law. It repealed Section 112.31425. Because there's no longer any statutory authority for subsection 1J of this rule, or for the Form 40 that it, that it incorporates, <laughs> this proposed amendment simply removes and strikes subsection 1J from the rule. I offer it now for your review, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Schaefer? Is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard on this roll? Um, we now turn to deliberation and discussion by commission members. Does anyone? Commissioner? Mr. Chairperson, I don't recall that there are any open cases that would have applied under this. Um, is that correct? Commissioner Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Uh, through the chair. Um, uh, no, Commissioner, I, I do not believe there are any, and it's just been very rarely used. And uh, there have uh, been issues in the past that involved uh, the blind trust, and uh, those were various complaints through the years, but they have been disposed of, and they're now closed, and, and I'm not aware of anything that's currently open. And there's no statute of, limit no statute of limitations on, on those. So if somebody were to file something right now, it would be under current law. It wouldn't be under the law that was in place when that was... Uh, through the chair, if I might. Um, in terms of like uh, future complaints that come in um, after the blind trust law is repealed that deal with matters occurring when the blind trust law was in force, those sorts of historical uh, evolutionary things, that can get quite in the weeds legally and you have due process concerns and that sort of thing. Um, uh, typically anything substantive doesn't have retroactive effect, it, it goes forward. And uh, you would think that if somebody uh, was entitled to the protections of the blind trust law when it was enforced, that things happening then uh, probably would not be actionable. But that uh, if they uh, have a blind trust and uh, it's, it's still an active trust instrument um, and the statute goes away, then you may not have the protections that the statute affords. Uh, kind of a, a correlative point about this is that there are a lot of things dealing with financial disclosure that uh, trust impact whether those trusts are blind or not. And so a lot of that reality that has always existed independent of the blind trust law probably still exists on the financial disclosure front. The uh, blind trust provision was mainly a protection against some of these uh, conflicting employment statutes and the voting conflict law to a limited extent, but uh, I know I've probably talked too long on that, but I don't think you can uh, hit anybody up probably for things in the past when they were relying on a valid statute, but then when the statute goes away and it doesn't exist, then they, they cannot rely on it in the future. Okay. All right, I've, I failed to close the public hearing, so I will do that at this time. Okay. There's any further discussion? I have a motion, please. Is that Mr. Gilzean? Uh, uh, motion by Commissioner Lesnoff, second by Commissioner Gilzean. Is there any further discussion? Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Uh, the rule is adopted. Can I just? Certainly. Like the other, the, the, the disclosure, not the disclosure, the disproportionate share rule, then this goes to someplace else for them to look at it in terms of deciding whether or not it's correct and then eventually it will get certified by the Division Administration? And through the Chair, yes. what happens is that prior to this hearing, I already submitted uh, this particular amendment as well as the amendment we're about to discuss to JAPSI, okay. which kind of reviews these rules. We haven't gotten any feedback or comments from JAPSI, which would seem to imply they're comfortable with it. Uh, on Monday, I'm required by law to, to send JAPSI a no change letter on both these amendments, indicating that there's been no change from what we initially gave them. Uh, JAPSI then issues to the Department of State what's called a Certificate of Compliance, certifying that, that everything is ready for the rule to be filed for adoption. And then all that's left is for me to file the rule for adoption at the Department of State. I think I think I have to file it. I have to wait two weeks after this hearing before I can file with the Department of State. And then that's, that'll be it. Mr. Anderson, do you have anything? No. I'm moving on to the second rule hearing concerning Rule 34-7.025. The hearing is now open. Mr. Schaefer, please explain this matter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this amendment proposes an addition to Rule 34-7.025 
That rule lists the types of public officers that have to get four hours of annual ethics training in each year. Uh, currently, the rule mentions elected municipal officers as well as constitutional officers, which is a term of art defined in the statutes. But during this past legislative session, a new law became effective. This relevant portion is included in your materials, which added commissioners of CRAs to the list of officers that have to get that four hours of training in. This proposed amendment just adds CRA commissioners, the types of officers designated to get the four hours of training in each year. I offer the draft amendment for your review, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Any questions of Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Um, Pilsing. Thank you, Madam Chair. In some cases, the CRA commissioners are elected commissioners. Would that mean that they would have to do the training twice, or will doing one will suffice for both their elected office and the CRA office? Through the chair, I think that, that one training will suffice. As long as they get four hours of, of ethics training in, that'll meet their requirement. Any further questions from the commissioners? Is there any from, anyone from the public that wishes to be heard on this rule? Okay, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. I may I have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Berger, second by Commissioner Gilzean. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Oops, oh, my apologies. <laughs> it says, I'm, I'm on the aye. Okay. Uh, approved unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Carvajal. We are now on item eight, which is reports. I have no report. Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of things I'd like to mention in addition to the written executive director's report. Um, the, uh, the House and the Senate uh, both have uh, uh, proposed committee bills uh, that uh, would uh, implement the penalty from Amendment 12, which was the, you know, the thing that we did the laborious rulemaking on. And uh, it's a pretty simple approach that they're taking. Uh, they're basically reenacting the penalty provisions generally in the Code of Ethics, uh, which would include then the new, new additions to um, Article 2, Section 8. And it, it seems to me to be a really reasonable way to do it. And uh, they were kind enough to invite me over to the Senate where I was uh, uh, given the opportunity to give them some background on our rulemaking and, and different things. And uh, um, I think I'll be doing the same thing with the House this week uh, coming up. And so uh, that was like the third part of the sandwich, so to speak. It was the CRC and the voters on the amendment and the commission here on the rule, and now the legislature on the penalty to um, – uh, put forth on that, uh, and it uh, looks like uh, that, that's going forward uh, in, a, in a pretty seamless and, and straightforward manner. Uh, Ms. Stillman, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Okay, thank you. And um, also, uh, just one other matter, um, there uh, is a uh, House Bill uh, number 611, which is uh, similar to uh, Senate Bill 766 and Senate Bill 768 which um, uh, is related to uh, part of it, if it passes, would have the Ethics Commission be a general repository for lobbyist registration for lobbyists that uh, lobby all of the many local governments in Florida. Mm -hmm. It would be a uh, <clears throat> quite a comprehensive undertaking. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so, uh, um, it's uh, kind of in its infancy in terms of this session. Uh, I think it has been up before several times. This concept uh, has not been enacted yet. Um, it has been assigned uh, to the House Public uh, Integrity and Ethics Committee. I don't think they have it on any sort of calendar yet for a hearing. But uh, Ms. Stillman and I, of course, are, are um, paying attention to it. And um, as we are, excuse me, other legislation. but. Uh, yeah, if it uh, passes, it would be a significant uh, increase in responsibility for the commission, and uh, uh, would be a, you know really a, a lot of stuff um, in addition to the electronic filing of financial disclosure that we already uh, are tasked with. But uh, um, in any event, uh, I don't think this commission has taken a position on this. This is sort of like the legislative prerogative. If they want to do it, certainly they can. But uh, we would want to weigh in on the detail and the timelines for uh, implementation of it. So uh, we'll be in, involved with it. Could you provide those the numbers again? <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, 
House Bill 611 and uh, Senate Bill 766 and Senate Bill 768. <coughs> All right. We have concluded our public session agenda. Um, and we are going to look at the executive session to see what we can start early. But after adjournment, if we could take a five-minute break, and we, and also there has been a, a continuance in that one of the, the matters of the executive session. Oh, certainly. All right, well, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, I just got I got too many dogs in my house. I had to take a drink of water there. You know, I, I've been trying to boot them out, but the other family members just love them. But uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that um, uh, Commissioner Berger. Um, has really uh, honored the commission here. Uh, I've been made aware that uh, in January he's going to be receiving the uh, pro bono award for the 19th Judicial Circuit uh, to be presented, I believe, at the Florida Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, we know how solid you are here and how solid you are in your law practice and, and there are obviously how much you care about people that are less fortunate. So uh, I think that's certainly worth a round of applause for Commissioner Burton. <laughs> You want to, want to say a couple of words on that? <laughs> well, I want to say that really when you give, it comes back, and every every single person that's a commissioner on this body is volunteer. So thank you all for what you do. I know we all travel a long way, and we give to our community. I know that's why all of us are here, and I certainly appreciate you recognize me in the Brown Closet. I just, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to receive that award, and I'll be back in Tallahassee for an extra trip. So thank you all so much. Mr. Anderson. And, and one final uh, note here, um, the uh, next two meetings of the Ethics Commission, because the court has had some things that happened since we made our schedule, the next two meetings of the Ethics Commission will not be here. We expect we will be back here after that, and uh, we have a wonderful relationship with the court, and we enjoy meeting here, but uh, of course, you know, they have things they have to do too. And uh, you'll be getting notices about, you know, where the location of the next two meetings will be as you get your materials uh, for those meetings. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, Mr. Max? Uh, yeah, I drove halfway around Capitol Circle to get here. <laughs> 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 but I, I think we want to give an attaboy to Carolyn for the nice letter that was in the packet that we have. Uh, she gave an ethics talk, and it was apparently well received. Anything else from the commission? All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gilzine, second by Commissioner Brady. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. All right. Five minutes. Let's start again at uh, 920. <laughs> I just really want another cup of coffee. That's how that works.